Looks like we are live with another episode of the Manny Wolf Show. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in, supporting, and allowing me to uh, kind of live my mission of bringing you great conversations with brilliant minds. Today, we have Keith Salmon with us. Keith, how are you? Doing well, Manny. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I am uh, glad to have you. I have no small interest in um, uh, storytelling. I have, in fact, it's something that I was teaching for quite a while. Uh, fortunately, to my to my tendency to evolve and change interests, fortunately, I've been able to do that. And and the audience that I have with me, I think, has come to expect that. But storytelling was a big passion. Is a big passion. Uh, let's find out how you got into storytelling. Well, my uh, thanks for asking. It's a good question for me. I I came to California in 1985 with the hopes and dreams of getting involved in the, in, uh, the film business. Ah, okay. Um, I got lucky enough to uh, get a job three weeks into my journey. And um, uh, at that point in time, I, I was working for a company called Asinidi, a small little editorial company, post-production company. However, my boss, my mentor-to-be, which I didn't know at the time, was he was one of the best film editors in commercial broadcasting uh, advertising in the country. And... I came in under his wing and I became a film editor really quickly. Um, so film editing was sort of my, uh, my doorway into storytelling and understanding how I can manipulate story um, through uh, something that had already been sort of shot, you know, c c uh, basically manipulating that way. And years later, after hundreds of television commercials and music videos and things like that, um, I got my first chance to do um, a feature um, it was an Oliver Stone film, the football movie, and a given Sunday. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's telling stories from on a dramatic side of things, but still mm -hmm. telling, telling stories. Uh, I got um, jumped into real, real people. Real people, but I've always been drawn to real people in the advertising world, you know, unscripted, basically. Yeah. yeah. Say, say, like the Saturn account was a really good example, uh, Levi's account, um, where they would put the camera on people and much like um, we're doing now, it's unscripted. And then they had, I became known for taking that and, and making that story, making a pitch, making a 10 hour interview into a 30 second commercial that would grab you. Right, right. Um, so that followed me into um, uh, the documentary. After I did that feature, the Oliver Stone film, I got um, sought after for doing uh, long form, mm -hmm. a, a different, different type of narrative. And so in, uh, in that journey, someone had come and approached to me uh, to do a film to resurrect and edit on a, on a project about uh, gangs in LA, black gangs of Bloods and Crips, <clears throat> uh, very, very powerful sort of story. And I got involved and I realized what was missing in that uh, narrative was that the uh, filmmaker, uh, his name is Clee Sloan, uh, was still around to tell that story, and he hadn't gone on camera to tell that story. And I convinced him to um, to let me interview him, and and that changed my life. Those interview days changed my life because I was not only in the in the edit room manipulating stories; I was helping someone bring that story out um, to uh, to reality from inside them, which they were unaware of uh, even how to tell those stories. So I, I became uh, really, really good at that. And, and so a journey came to, um, it just followed me around this, sto this storytelling. So uh, I've taken it to where I am now and I'm teaching that for people. There's a lot of people on the, I call it the front end of, of our business mm -hmm. that um, they end up s spending quite a bit of money and effort and time falling into funnels and things like that. Right, and they haven't really gotten in tune with their story. So I've taken it full circle. I believe in teaching. I believe in academics who have experience, real credentials, mm -hmm. and uh, and that, and that's where I'm at today. Wow, um, there's a lot here. I want to just borrow from you. <laughs> there's a lot yes. here I want to absorb from you. Absolutely. Now, now once again, um, I mentioned this before we started. I don't vet. My, my interviews, because I so far have had these wonderful surprises virtually every time. I did not know that you were on the visual end of storytelling. 
Uh, and I saw and was profoundly kind of impacted, not by the story of any given Sunday. I thought it was a good story. You know, it was like, yeah, it's it's a, it's a little bit of a hero underdog story, whatever. It's got a, a couple of nice layers and twists. But uh, the, the, the editing and the cinematography, I think, told the story the most powerfully. I'm really curious first to know specifically... It was the first place I had seen, I don't know the name of this style, so I'll just describe it to you. The action on the field. I'll never forget that because you had those, the the filter, the color filter, I believe it was like a, a gold filter, I think, like a bright, like a, a, a flood of white light and with a little bit of gold in it. It made it very intense. And then everything, is, correct me if I'm wrong here, everything was done with these little split second skips. Is that right? Uh, it was like there, instead of the action moving like a person moving in a fluid kind of a movement, it was like. Ch -ch 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 -ch. There was a lot of technique and in that film, uh, a lot of I, different, obviously. Diff I mean, it's sort of like every trick in the book. And okay, I mean, I mean 20 years later, I, I, 20 years later, there were almost every cliche in the book also. But in terms of film right. technique, it was an interesting uh, um approach mm -hmm. uh there was night footage in a, in a you know we didn't want to do tv we, you know mm -hmm. oliver stone had a, a a real vision in mind like we just don't do tv style coverage on football right try to make it experiential um and so uh, that was a back in uh before we were all digital in uh, yeah. high definition and uh, 4k mm -hmm. or whatever 6k 8k yeah. uh yeah. this was 35 <laughs> millimeter film Mm -hmm. And it was a Technicolor three-stripe process. I don't know all that much about it, except that we would be, uh, we would, that's back in the day when we would watch um, footage. We would see literally uh, projected footage. Mm -hmm. How you make that light uh, effective and dramatic in a night game, uh, there was a pivotal point in that movie when the team sold uh, Jamie Foxx's character out mm -hmm. in the night rain game, beautifully shot, uh, Sal Titino. Um, was the uh, DP, um, and that didn't come easy. That stuff, uh, the uh, vintage old time footage and the ghosts and things like that. Yeah. I, I, I uh, you know, there was all kinds of experimental on the film stock and the developing and the forced. Uh, you know, Sal would be a good a good person to talk to because that that in a book could be a book in itself. But we would screen, and what would be more most effective? We would screen the dailies and in, in print because that was a uh, you know just a different technology back then. And yeah. yeah, so much of it needed to be achieved in the camera, and uh, so he, all that stuff and the the rigs and the experiential I was talking about the experiential yeah. um, parts of the football action you wanted to be in it you know you'd be in the huddle, and I, uh, you, 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 yeah, and I very you, much remember feeling that right. I, I mean, again, the thing that that really sort of punched me in the solar plexus about that film was all of the visual components. Right. Uh, this is, this is unbelievably exciting for me to get to dissect this with you, especially mm. because I didn't know <laughs> that this was what we were going to be talking about. Um, so from the perspective of we're trying to tell a story here using um, a story that I, I would say uh, at the risk of, of sort of, you know, glad handing you because you're on the program, I would say that there's a story told there that is, it, it's supported by the narrative and the, and the, and the script and the, and the uh, dialogue, of course, but a story that could be told without the dialogue. That, there's, a, that's a certain truth to that. There's a certain truth and there's a, a journey, there's a journey of, uh, you know, yeah. Of of defeat and victory and humility, and um, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, from my perspective, I kind of think the opposite in some ways. Uh, it's very very visual, mm -hmm. but for uh, I think the part of the reason that I was burned, I had done a lot of football advertising, Nike football, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nike uh, Jerry Stiller as Lombardi character. I did that campaign, which helped me into get, getting that job on that film. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the action is one thing, but the emotion is another thing. The, the de agony of defeat, there's an opening yeah. montage. I literally had to, uh, there's an opening montage and there's a, uh, a photograph of Lombardi as the thinker. It's a beautiful photograph that my mother sent me 
and had it framed for me. And and there was a, uh, it's very difficult to, to kind of compact some of these dramatic personnel stories because yeah. I had to sneak in and put that film in because the opening of the film was this Lombardi quote, you know, on the field by Victorious, you know, the right. and so on and so forth. Uh, and I put that in and that's what I introduced the, 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 the ghosts, which went to me. It was the heritage and the homage to, and the respect for everyone who's played this game and wherever they have played it on the ground. On the ground is a sacred place in a football field. I mean, that's if we're going that way, that's what, what I had to believe. So I personally, I'm the quiet, uh, the, the quietest guy in the room generally. Sure. Not that I'm not thinking, but yeah. I'm, I'm manipulating my way into making an impact wherever, if I have a cast of characters that's around me that's uh, uh, gonna push me around, I'll, I'll push back. Uh -huh. and, and so, uh, however, when it came down to like the, the humility parts, there's a, a, a pivotal scene in, in that film when Lawrence Taylor, um, was schooling Jamie Foxx in the steam room. And he was like, it's, uh, it, 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 it's after uh, conflict, you know, mm -hmm. Jamie Foxx conflict with, uh, with uh, the Al Pacino character. And, you know, big shark as he was, he was known as shark Lawrence Taylor's character. And he, um, what can I say? He, he was a big tough guy, but didn't appear to have a lot of wisdom until that scene. Mm -hmm. And his wisdom was very, very strong. Yeah. And he told he told he told Jamie Foxx what's up. And yeah. it was it yeah. was very, very pivotal. But but I, I think you're right. I mean you could you could go from scene one, game I, I, not scene one, game one, all the way through it, and you would get it. You would totally get what happened in the strife and yeah, you know, the, the homage to the Char to Ben Hur and Charlton Heston mm -hmm. and and all that. There's generationally uh, a lot of stuff going on in that movie. I, I totally get that. Yeah. And and it's making me think that I feel like that. And I don't want this to be too much about Oliver Stone or, or movie making. I want to get into your process and your way of thinking. But I do think that you're you're sort of triggering me to think that I think all of Oliver Stone's films have. Does he come in with a really strong kind of idea about the visual sense and about the if you could call it that, the nonverbal storytelling? I think so. I, I think uh -huh. uh, what I, I did, I wasn't sure. I mean, I never, didn't know what I was going to be get into. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my first really long conversation on the show was we, we were speaking of film technique, and I'll get back to the, the question real quick, but uh, I was we would go screen no matter if it was 2 o'clock in the morning. We were at one thirty. We met at this nightclub in the basement of a ni nightclub, and Technicolor had set up a screening room and because they were shooting day and night, night games. Night games mm -hmm. at the Orange Bowl and daytime and sets and everything like that. So we were and everybody was sort of in trouble that night for some reason. And, and I had only been in Miami for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and hadn't had very many one-on-ones with OS as we would refer to him as, and he, um, he came to me. I don't even sure if he even remembered that he hired me and he came to me before that screening and says, I'm going to need to talk to you after this. I'm like, God, how did I get fired? I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> right. and, yeah. and, and then uh, it was the two of us walked around after that screening. Everybody kind of got a little bit of uh, talking to, and it, it was not a very fun screening. Let me just leave it at that. Okay. But we, um, we then Oliver grabbed me. I was thinking maybe he's not going to remember that he said that to me. And he, so he grabbed me, and we walked around. And we walked around um, South Beach. Mm -hmm. And... I wasn't sure if we were going to get kidnapped or what was going to happen, but it was interesting. But he, <laughs> but he, he wanted to have that talk with me about the commitment yeah. to, to the process, yeah. to the process that it's a, it's a, all we have. So his, what, what I really enjoyed about him grabbing me like that is that if I had something personal to say to him, I would grab him when we, we all uh, headquartered here in Santa Monica about a block from where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. And um, if I needed him, I, I knew that I didn't want to ever embarrass him or confuse him in front of a group. So I would grab sure. him, I'd walk him to his car, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah. what, uh, back to your point though, he had a vision, but his vision was he, he brought people on board. He brought me on board to contribute. Yeah. He brought me on board to, he never sat in the editor room. We would come up with, uh, with what our dreams of our visions were 
whether they worked or not uh, would would only re remain to be seen in the context of what sure. we were doing. Yeah. And um, but in terms of say, I would say like in a broad sense, like we need the night foot, we need the football coverage to not look like anyone's ever seen it before. Yeah. And that's sort of like the main objective. And that's a vision in itself. And yeah. how do we do that? How do we tweak it? Is it too dark, the night games? Right. Is it too bright? If you wash it out, it's a risky thing that he did. It's a very, very uh, courageous thing that he did with yeah. that photography. Yeah. And, and I was, I was, I was, you know, needless to say, I was a lot younger than everybody was a lot younger then, but it was, it was a life changing uh, process for me. It that's really that's so yeah. cool. Um, so then I think that it, what it sounds like to me is he, he hired wisely. He trusted the people he hired and he gave you latitude led by an overarching vision. Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's fantastic. But then um, you have, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of time to experiment. Uh, we came back from right. a, screen, a screening once and we said, well, somebody said, what if game three was game one and game two was game one? It's like, so you flip it upside down and it's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. um, and if uh, one, one quick thing is on that, on the storytelling aspect of that is, is that um, I, I was really, really blessed to have a, an opportunity to, uh, you know, that when I snuck in and made that main title opening sequence with my mom's photograph in there and, and the, uh, the, the music. The music was this uh, uh, song that uh, composed by Robbie Robertson. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was called Ghost Dance. It's vividly, and I put it in there and it was, I presented, we would always present in a collective room uh, where, uh, you know, we were uh, basically, we were only as good as our last presentation. So I, I, was, I was like nervous. I had the, uh, the lightning and the ghosts and all that stuff and I presented it and it had Robbie's track in. And, and it was just a, a feeling that I had. And like I was saying about the, the homage to the people who had played this game. And um, he, uh, Oliver looked at me and said, this is bold, this is bold. And uh, Robbie Robertson was in the, in the studio the next day. He wasn't even on, attached to the film at that point, but he became, a, <laughs> he, he, beca he was in that next day. I spent, a, uh, I, every time Robbie came in, I got to work with him. And it was, wow. it was, it was, he, he, he told about the story. I mean, because the story, music is a huge part of story oh, because man. it's sort yeah. of like, if you, if you get the, if for me, my history has been, if I find the right track that works yeah. with the right voice and you yeah. can close your eyes and see it without seeing the visuals, then you've got something. And, and that's what I've really, yeah. really, you know. Yeah. So I think, um, I think the Coen brothers and, and T-Bone Barnett really yeah. kind of make that point. Yeah. Um, let's get into you. Thank you for indulging me on this sort of industry stuff and this fascinating it's, stuff. It's hard not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. But so, so um, what are you doing now? Let's start there. What is well, your work now? Well, I'm I'm coaching story. I feel I consider myself a story coach. I, in what I, sense, though? In in um, my experience in my I'm still I'm still filming and still uh -huh. editing, but I'm not as much anymore. I, I've done a few documentaries lately. I still do a commercial here and there, mm -hmm. um, but I um, I always knew that I would get into teaching, and uh -huh. I didn't I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to me. Um, I have a, uh, I mentioned my, my, my mentor, his name was Jim Edwards at the company that I started here. And he was, he was, uh, you know, somebody, it was like, I always knew to learn from the best. When mm -hmm. I was in college, I had a, a professor named Bob Jacobs, uh, and a person who was not just an academic, he was a person who lived it and breathed it. He's from, he was from SC. Um, Ray Bradbury was his best friend. Um, he, uh, I went to school at Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and I met this guy, Bob Jacobs. He got me to California. We spent a day with Frank Capra. We spent a day with Ray Bradbury and I got to, I got to host Ray Bradbury ever since. So there's people, but he, Bob has written, I don't know, a hundred books. He used to write for the midnight special and many different episodic, uh, television shows. And he's a creator and he's, he's not just an academic. So I always thought that I would transition somehow as I've always taught my people that have worked for me and, and whatever. And, you know, I'd hate to see them go. I'd break my heart to see them go. 
And then when I saw their name on the end of a movie or I heard that they worked on a commercial or something like that, I, I would be very proud all of a sudden. My, you know, my pride would be hurt. I, I knew what that was like. Yeah. So I had a suggestion. Um, my journey into the online space, if we call this space the on online space, teaching and coaching, and uh, it could be called something else. But uh, what I talk about story is that I tried to do this somewhere around the recession. I went and said, you know, it's good. Maybe there's a transition. Maybe yeah. there's a transition. And I, I wasn't really willing to give up my, my uh, career. However, and, but I wasn't sure how I could connect. I couldn't mm -hmm. walk in at that point. I wasn't really even shooting. I was, I was only editing. So it's hard to walk up to a citizen like at the grocery store right. or at, or at uh, an online marketing event that's going to give you a, an introduction to a, a program and say, I'd love to do some editing for you. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, I'm in a business that I worked for advertising agencies and, and things like that. I just didn't have, I didn't have a line in. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't really, uh, you know, I, un, unfortunately, what I did was I spent a lot of money. <laughs> I remember yeah. getting in a mastermind class. I'm like, wait a minute, there's no mastermind sitting at this table. And yeah. I'm not one of them either. Right. Yeah. And, and but that was, t that was a hefty price tag. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would uh, come back, I'd leave, I'd come back and just dabble in it. And then I get a couple of, uh, of calls in the, in the last couple of years. And, and they said, you know, you should really kind of look into this and think about it. Maybe you could do some sort of, some sort of thing online. Uh, and just, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to teach you how to edit. I mean, there's a hundred tutorials. There's, you can get premiere. I used to, when we first bought, I mean, I used to cut on film and those machines cost 50,000 bucks or more a pop. Right. Our, our first nonlinear system was a hundred grand to detail that thing out. And now you can get a premiere for $20 a month. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a good thing. And it's a bad thing for depending on how you look at it. It's a great thing because there's creativity that's available to everyone. Yeah. Um, and so what happened is I, I came back and I, I was a little slow coming in. And I said, you know what? I, I think we have to stay in our lane here. I think we have to teach what we know. And okay. if there's anything else, if it's a film, if it's a, a feature length documentary, if it's a music video, I'm going to just name drop real quick. Sure. Uh, we didn't start the fire. It was the first, uh, second music video I cut. I was 26, and it was a unbelievable experience. And I took some risks there, but but the narrative in that story is just all, it's it's visual, but it's all of course driven by the lyric. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just think that uh, this getting back that was this kind of that just that just popped into my head. Just wanted to say that. But yeah. so I, I went uh, I went. And built out, staying in my lane. Uh, I guess what I was talking about. No matter what the genre is, for me, if it's three shots in a row, I want to make a story out of it. Yeah. If it's if it's a person who's coming into an online system, uh, it, you know, into uh, hey entrepreneurial land, we're on we're online and we're gonna build we're gonna build you a business and you get a coaching program and it's like and they get reeled in. They got like here 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 comes. I call it the seeker demographic. Mm -hmm. I was one of the seeker demo. I was one of them, mm -hmm. and and I've I've really dedicated my uh, my story path to helping people that come in as seekers and don't have a clue about how valuable their story is, and they they you know they don't have um, they want to have a they want to have uh, a, a business. They want to launch a coaching program, but they're not in tune with how that how to connect with people. Yeah. And and it's not about what you do; it's about who you are. And and um, I can I think by virtue of how many people I've interviewed, I've always had a knack of listening. I'm going to go back to any given Sunday for a second. Is that what I learned about even in a dramatic sense like that? When there'd be like a five camera set up on on a scene i remember this scene very vividly of lawrence taylor in whether he's going to play or not because he could he could die on the field the the, yeah. the dilemma there and there's shots of al pacino where he's only got a couple of lines and he's got a couple of reaction shots but his face he is a receiver he is a, a he teaches the the art of listening is something that i teach the listening that he has uh in his face all of a sudden, you've got Lawrence Taylor, who's who's not one of our better act actors, but sure. 
unbelievably because he could he Al Pacino could look at him and it'd be like he's like laser uh, X ray vision in him and all of a sudden he would be himself and what he what Oliver Stone wanted was him to be himself that's what I think he wanted and when he was genuine he connected and I felt I felt for him so people have that that um, burning desire to uh, to become something. Uh, to make a transition in their life to, yeah. uh, you know, maybe they great, maybe they raise their kids mm -hmm. and, and uh, they're in, in like, well, what are we going to do now? What am I going to, what, what about my dreams? Right. Right. And, yeah. and, and I can help them find that they have, they have a value, you know, sometimes they're, they're the worst thing in their world that could, that ever happened to them can be their strongest assets. And of course. I, yeah. I've, I've just known that even my, I'm kind of a newcomer uh, mm -hmm. to this space for sure. But you know, I've got the people that I work with are they're they're from every different walk of life. Yeah. And and usually in the first ten minutes, I kind of have a good idea what what I can help them with. So, but what 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 pieces do you do? I guess is what I'm curious because your your background is in film and editing. Um, storytelling in the entrepreneurial online space is, is thought of at least as far more about your ability to verbally speak a compelling story or to write it. Now, right. are you helping with both? Are yes. you? Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your, your process with the, uh, the verbal part of storytelling. Well, the Drawing, verbal, yeah, go ahead. The verbal part is, uh, is basically, uh, you know, everybody's got their own level. And of course we're in the selfie generation. Sure. And um, so, however, uh, when somebody says just, uh, you know, you just need to do it on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's maybe true, but, but uh, you know about uh, performance. And, uh, and, you know, if you're on the stage, if you're on, it, say, even in acting, if you're on the stage and all of a sudden you get on and you do a movie and you're in a close-up, I have a great Ken Howard story I'd like to tell you about someday. Yeah. He, he, he taught, you know, the, um, where it's just a different... A different thing. So the, the idea that without telling someone they look like an idiot, I'm going to bring them into a zone. It's like, maybe let's consider something like this. I, you know, my background here is a little junky. If we were selling mm -hmm. something, I'd do something yeah, different about this, but I, I didn't want to risk streaming for, for our uh, viewers to, <laughs> to just uh, screw that up. So I, I should have fixed it up. So, so I, along with it, I'll have people do some exercises that aren't attached to their own personal story to get okay. them loose. Um, there's a famous Sears commercial, famous in my world, that in college, um, uh, we were, we, everybody in the whole radio TV film department did the Sears commercial and they, they, and so they read about it in the newspapers. They're unbelievable, blah, 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 blah. So uh, at that moment in time, I knew I was destined to be on the other side of the camera because that was not me. I was not going to be on camera. No, and, and so many of the people in that secret demographic, they come in and they, they drop off at a certain point. Well, I love the idea of all this and I'd love to make some money. I love my dreams, but I'm not going to go on camera. It's right. like, well, let's get over the fear. So it's really fear. There's so much about this is fear. I don't want to tell you that I, I, I ran into someone who had, um, I don't want to tell what, what they're, but, but she had an affliction. She okay. had this affliction, affliction in her life that she had, he had, she had overcome, and it was this strong, strong story. But you know, it was twenty minutes into the conversation uh, when you found out that that's what it was. So what there was, and, and I go, that's the pivot. That's that's what makes you strong. That's what makes your vision come through, and that's your audience. Not only that, you find your vision, you find your audience right there in that moment. Yeah, and and so um, it's it's a matter of the people because I, I mean I I relate to it. I, jump around a little bit but it's i take them through let's talk about the origin you know it's a classic origin story uh -huh. what uh where do you want to go where did you start and what is holding you back yeah. and uh, the second second step is the fear let's get out of the fear why is those are those if we can get through those things and look back at them and make them uh not the monsters that you think they are you'll you'll you can you cannot share so much about your pain you can share about your transformation yeah. And if you get a handle on that right in that moment, your confidence level comes up. Uh, I, I, I just have seen it happen um, over and over again. And, and so the confidence comes up and then 
you can believe that you can do anything. And, and, there, and it's not that it's, it isn't grounded. I mean, it is very grounded. It's, it's not a, just a feel good thing. This is about building business. This is about uh, getting those visions clear about what you want to do. Um, and if I can help you do that, um, that's, that's, it's just, uh, outstanding. And, and, the, you know, that's, I have seven steps that I go through and, mm -hmm. and, um, it's just, it seems to be no matter who you are, you can always use these, these, uh, these steps for me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let's do one thing. Let's back up just a little bit and let's yeah. clarify what you call the secret demographic. I feel like we've mentioned that twice and maybe it, you know, people might be left a little bit okay. uh, behind the curve there. Okay. Uh, I, no, it's seeker. S E E. Oh, seeker. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I should have, I should have popped that up. Uh, seeker, the people seeking something, they're seeking something and they're maybe not sure what it is. And they okay. kind of, uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And that makes and perfect I, sense. That clarifies for me and hopefully so, for the audience. Yeah. Yes. Seeker. Uh, sorry about that. No. Um, <laughs> and, and, and because, you know, some of the uh, little free seminar here or even the webinars or free this, you know, people are diving in and they're looking at it and they're going, well, maybe that's for me. Maybe that'll fix me. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll take care of everything. Yeah. Maybe if I build the funnel, everything will be okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just one funnel away after all. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I said something and it's something I was working on the other day. It's like, and it just came out. I didn't write it. It just came out. It's like, well, you know, don't build a funnel, at least not right now, because you may fall in and you'll never come out. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's not it to say I'm not slamming the funnels, but you need them, but you don't need them before you have a story. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, and then so once you get people's story sort of figured out with them and 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 made compelling, do you then move into helping with the visual and video aspects? Uh, well, it, it's a not not necessarily. I, I I try to get them to to do their own. You know, this is about a, a, say it's a single person op operation. Sure. And, and uh, but you know, part of what I think is is for the uh, seeker demographic, mm -hmm. they yeah. are under this illusion that they can do it all themselves. But right. the reality is, they need a team. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's just in my in my little welcome pack. It's like you know, tripod. That's a good idea. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and so, if in fact someone wants to do it on their own, we can. You can. You you can. You can at least get to that next step. And where the team building comes in, where you, if it depends where they're set up. You know, one of the things that we talk about is our. You know, people don't want to talk about is their financial situation. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about that because that's a fearful thing. Um, do you going to just jump into an uh, an ex, uh, you know a, a bigger program after you? spend all your money you you can't right um so yes it's it's about it, it, and if if in fact someone has the resources mm -hmm. i would absolutely help them out but i would more than more than likely consult with them because the the hardware of of me walking in with a six person crew yeah. is usually not that's this demographic is not that person however right. you know there are there are some you know, I work with some people that are sure. in my, uh, you know, a couple, I've got a couple of celebrities that I, I work with and uh, that uh, it's a different animal, but however, the same sort of situ, the same kind of blueprint, if you will, or roadmap or whatever yeah. it's called uh, is, um, it's still work. It's still the same. And, okay. and, you know, but it, but it changes for each person for, for obvious reasons where their goal, it's all about goals. If we don't have goals sort of tricked out, then, then there's no place to go. Yeah. The, you know, there's, yeah. I would think that given your unique sort of, uh, um, uh, work background and your, your, you know, in the movies and in, in, in uh, with mixing with those people and with the influx of, celebrity level people coming into the online space that might be a really great niche you might you might have a whole audience just sitting there waiting to be tapped um be hope. yeah hope so so, yeah. so <laughs> let's see um i want to be respectful of your time here and i i there's a couple of questions i have but i guess maybe the right way to go for for now and we can circle back later is Let's 
let's have you share what you feel is the most important and misunderstood um, element or elements of storytelling and story creation. Well, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, auth authentic. If I'm talking mm -hmm. about, so if we're talking about someone telling their own story is the authenticity. Okay. Um, I say um, once upon a time stories aren't meaning I was born, you know, I mean, those, those generally mm -hmm. will, we, there's never enough time because there's, you, you need to connect all the dots between yeah. the time yeah. you were born and now. So um, uh, it's, it's finding those compelling moments to grab somebody, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if you want to call it a hook, uh, it, it, you know, or if you want to call it uh, just something that you can connect with. Um, it also depends on the format. You know, if it's 30 seconds, you know, you've got to back in an offer somehow. You've got to yeah. back it in. Yeah. And, you, 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 and then you've got to, you've got to uh, like if I say, if I teach connecting all the, all the dots, uh, we've got to put um, three dots in our, in our huge hero select role over here right. yeah. that we can choose from and try those dots out. And depending on who you're talking to, you've got to be able to be resourceful and pick one to go with that particular audience. Yeah. Um, so I think the, uh, the biggest thing is, uh, and I'm kind of doing it right now, I'm telling, I'm telling way too much uh, <laughs> and, and not being concise. Because it's it's like it's a it's a it's a hook that's an emotional driving connection point right. for the commuter. It just it's not just a, it's just not how bad things were. No, it's about how you recovered from that. Right. And yeah. and, and and here, if I can, I mean, uh, if I can show you how I did it, it may make your life better. Yeah. Um. And 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 I think one of the things is uh, is, is promising. You know, I can't promise. Uh, through what I do, like I say, I'm I'm staying in my lane. I'm not going to say I, I can make you six figures in two weeks. I'm not going to do that because that's, yeah. you know, I'm not going to swear on your show, Manny, for the first time I'm on your show. But you know what I'm saying? It's not. You're more than welcome to swear. <laughs> on <you>, By the way, <laughs> well, it's it's just BS. And, and yeah, I, and, I take your point. Yeah, and and so so I think that you know clarity, clarity, emotional, and make a reasonable offer. Yeah, uh, is a good place to start. Okay, good. Um, I appreciate that. I would could probably spend all day diving into your your stories about working on movies and and stuff like that. It's fascinating to me. Um, I want to I want to just stop here. Thank you for your time. Um, if I had ample more time, I would I would just dive down the rabbit hole with you. Uh, but where can people find you? <clears throat> Should they want to know more uh, about you and, and your process? Uh, KeithSalmon.net. Okay. KeithSalmon.net. Um, and um, that's the best place to find me. Great. You can email, email, email me if you want to get directly on me. Of course, I'm on Facebook, Keith Salmon. Uh, Keith Salmon. Keith at KeithSalmon.net is a direct email you can get me at. Great. And um, you'll be seeing more of me. Great. I can't wait. Um, I am very curious to see as you integrate the experience you've had into this world that is largely people who have just decided they're storytellers and right. then, you know, um, and have little to no sort of, you know, track record to back it up. So <laughs> it's, it's good to have somebody in the game who comes from the world of storytelling. Right. Uh, if I could just say one, one quick little thing there um, is that when uh, my, in the process, I call it the process, like the workshop that I, that I'm uh, teaching, I call it own your story, own mm -hmm. your story for freedom. Yeah. And the light bulb moment is, is not just telling the story. It's when you own it, when you actually own it and realize how powerful it is, that's when the light bulb switches and people go, Oh, I do have value. I have value that I could give someone else in return from that. I might be able to get some value back as in. Um, so that, that, that's a, a critical part of, of it. And um, you know, in the process of my career of evaluating performance as even as a film editor, evaluating and, and picking the best moments is, is, is where my credential really can help people is, is in the evaluation in a non-judgmental way. Um, so I just 
wanted to toss that in there. So thanks. Yeah, that, that's a great postscript. If you would like help, guidance, insight, or clarity on your story, and uh, and finding those those hook moments, go see Keith. And uh, by the way, he spells his name just like the fish. So <laughs> that's right. Thank you so much, my friend. This has been uh, very, very interesting. I really appreciate your time. Manny, I'm a fan, so and I appreciate you asking me to be on. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right. Bye.